Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half Three, of your life. Two, one, action. Hello, and it's great to be here again with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, uh, and my great partner, John Coleman. Hello, John and John. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Art. John, good to see you again. Oh, um, I was recently reading the virtual gourmet. You, you often write about wines. In fact, you always have a wine uh, mm -hmm. selection down the bottom of your uh, newsletter. But you uh, recently have been writing about the wines of Italy. And I know uh, from the past that uh, these regions all have very specific rules about uh, what you can call things and like that. But my sense is that sometimes these rules these regulations, if you will, um, kind of, they're a double-edged sword. Do they, do they ever have a negative to them? They do now. Mm. Oh, why is that? I thought you'd never ask. Um, <laughs> when these laws were put into effect back in the 19th century, they're, they're Italian wine laws, and they're overseen by the government in league with the various uh, wine makers around Italy. And the reason was that if we all were to go back to the 1960s and early 70s, if you ask the average Italian, forget the average American or, or Russian or anybody, um, name, name some Italian wines. The average Italian would name only the wines he drinks on an everyday basis from his own region. Okay? If you ask most people outside of Italy back then, they'd say, oh, Chianti, you know? Um, they might say, uh, Rioniti, so nice on ice, um, or Bolo Suave. It was the, that would be about the extent of what most people outside of Italy would have even heard of. This in a country that produces more wine than uh, just about anybody in every single region of Italy, from all the way up to Switzerland, all the way down to the coast of Africa. Um, the Greeks called Italy, Enofrulia, because when they first sailed across the Aegean Sea, um, they could smell the grapes uh, offshore, um, and they found them growing wild. Well, the problem was that up until the 1960s, not only did not did people not know no. Italian wines, they didn't have much access to them because the better ones were not being sent abroad, were not being marketed, marketed wisely. Um, Italian wines are supposed to be like Chianti, Chianti, um, to come in a straw fiasco green bottle, uh, after which you drank the stuff in it, which may have been undrinkable. You could stick a candle in it and uh, put it on your table or your ledge with the other six bottles you had. And you go to a little Italian restaurant with a red checkered tablecloth, and there's the Chianti bottle with the candle sticking out of it. Okay, that's not very good to make an uh, international reputation for a, a wine culture as rich as Italy's. So what they did, the government said, let's make some sense out of this regionally. <clears throat> and they put into effect what were called the DOC rules. And DOC was denom Denominazione um, Origine Controllata, a denomination of the origin a controlled origin. So, what that says, if you buy a bottle of Italian wine, and it is Chianti, let's say, there's going to be a label in there saying DOC, meaning we're guaranteeing that this wine comes from Tuscany, and what's in that bottle is Chianti, made according to traditional uh, key, uh, uh, traditions in Chianti winemaking, which only uses certain specific grapes. Sangiovese, Colorino, Mamola, some others. They said, so if you're going to call this thing Chianti, and we're going to sell it abroad, that better be in the bottle. So they started off, and that was a very good thing, because they started to map out all over Italy uh, wines that were at that time called Misogynia, uh, uh, which meant uh, miscegenation. In other words, you, John, have a vineyard, and the seeds from your vineyard from grapes that you'd been growing for a thousand years come over into my vineyard who might have had different grapes growing there and they miscegenate. Okay, so we don't even know what grapes are there. The Italian wine laws were designed to figure that all out and it was a really great applaudable um, idea back in the 1670s. And then 
having established that, they established what we call the DOCG. And the G st stood for Garantita, guarantee. And this was a much higher appellation, meaning that not only is this a Chianti, but we are saying that Chiantis, which meet the high standards we set, are guaranteed to be among the premium quality wines of Italy. This was pretty phenomenal because they only awarded it to four and then the next year five. They only had five wines in all of Italy, not specific estates, specific regions like Barolo, Brunello Montalcino, you know, Nobile Montalcino, uh, Chianti Classico, which they're saying these are the very finest quality. The rest, we stand behind them. They are what you are drinking is in the bottle, but these are really good. Well, this is also a very big step forward, and it did an enormous amount for those five um, appellations. The trouble is, as so often happens when government gets in league with uh, lobbyists, let's say, or, or an industry, is that those who did not win a prize, say, the, or get an appellation or a DOCG, say, hey, what about us? We're putting money into this organization. It's like it's like in Scotland where the single malt scotches is all anybody wants to drink, but 99% of all the scotch out of Scotland is not single malt. And yet the 99%ers the were paying for the promotion of the single malt. So too in Italy, Barolo and Brunello are getting all of this, this, this great publicity, and they're sending it to wineries like myself and so forth, take, taking us to the vineyards while the others were f still foundering with a low reputation. Okay, said the wine rule people, we'll become more inclusive. So it began. So by the 1980s, where you once had maybe 150 appellations for the DOC, now you had 200, and now you have 300, and now you have today 550 appellations just for identifying wines. Of the DOCG, the highest quality wines in Italy, it started with five, and now I think the number is 55. I mean, it's, it's just become ridiculous. It's, it's, so in, in the article, I compared it to when my children were playing soccer, and they're you know, like seven years old, everybody at the end of the season, everybody got a trophy because you don't want to disappoint the little buggers, you know? So everybody gets a, gets a trophy. This is what has happened. So that what, on the one hand, is what good are those appellations anymore if everybody gets a prize? And number two, well, within those appellations, let's say Brunello di Montalcino. Back in the 1970s, there were five makers five estates in all of Tuscany making Brunello di Montalcino. They made wines that nobody would drink for more than 20 years because that's how long they took to mature. Everybody knew this, and they were very rare for that reason. They didn't produce very much, and they were old families. Well, after Brunello got a TOCG, people started to move in and buy land around Montalcino. Started producing their own Brunello. My namesake, who has nothing to do with me, John Mariani, who ran Banfi, um, looked uh, ampelographically into the best, healthiest clones for the Sangiovese grape, so you could make Brunello, and gave out the the uh, information that they gathered for for anybody to make Brunello with the five best uh, clones of the grape, which was a noble and wonderful thing for them to do. And what that meant is that all of these people came in and say, hey, we can make Brunello de Montalcino. We can sell this stuff for $100. The old timers are, but we're not going to wait for our product to, <clears throat> for $20 to come out into the 20 years to come out onto the market because that's a capital investment nobody could afford. So we're going to make a Brunello in 2016. <clears throat> we'll put it out in 2018. We'll save a reserva for 2019 or a Grand Reserve in 2019. But beyond that, we ain't going. So you have to make the wines in a different way. So it's not what Brunello once was famous for, what Brunello once got a DOCG for. Now it's for red wine made in and around Montalcino from the Sangiovese grape, of which there are now thousands and thousands and thousands of acres, uh, selling for a lot of money. So now uh, there are over 
200 makers of Brunello were once there were five. And this is wow. all because the Italian wine laws uh, allowed them to um, capitalize. So it's become kind of a farce. Yes, so the, indeed. So the, the value uh, to a consumer of reading the label at DOCG has really uh, slipped. Uh, where where we don't know what we're getting, do we? Oh, you know what you're getting, but you're just getting uh, more, much, much more of what what had once been a small batch of very, very good wines. You're getting well. What uh, what we're getting is we're getting uh, a less detailed uh, quality reference. That's what we're oh, getting. Yeah. We can't tell we can't tell the good from the great anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's also another wrinkle which is just as bad. Some of the finest winemakers of Italy, people like Angelo Gaia, who is in Piedmont, makes Barolas and Barbarescos, and some of the um, uh, people in Tuscany who wanted to go beyond the strictures that the rules set for what grapes can go into their wines, they wanted to not play around. They wanted to make wines with Cabernet Sauvignon in it and some of the other classic grapes of Europe. And uh, the uh, government said, fine, you can make anything you want, but you can't call it by uh, an, uh, a, uh, an Appalachian name. It says, well, it's, been, it's made right here. We're making it right here in Tuscany. We're making it right here in Chianti. Nope. You, you, you make a wine like that, it has to be called table wine. Just red table wine. Well, this was not good. So they came up with a third appellation called IGT which means Indicazione Geografica Tipico, a typical geographic indication of a wine made there. I mean, how good does that sound? You know? <laughs> and so, these wines are some of the best coming out of Italy. Some go for three, $400, and yet they're basically just labeled table wine. So unless you go into a wine store or read authorities like moi, you're never going to know how good these wines are by what's on the label that says, eh, that's an IGT. So, you know, they're really, you, you self-promoted yourself uh, before I got a chance to jump in. But the really kind of cool thing is that uh, over the uh, years now that uh, we've been uh, uh, taping these episodes, uh, you've been very uh, frank about uh, great wines that taste great no matter where they're from, whether they're from California, they're from Italy, they're from France, and that, well, yeah, it may not have that label of champagne, because it wasn't made in that region of France. But this is a darn good version of whatever that bubbly is. Enjoy it. Nope. Okay, so we can count on you to let us know that's the taste. Yeah, the government regulation, maybe there is something. Uh, and you're not shy about saying when a good bottle of wine, when, when it's really pricey, what a good bottle of wine uh, 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 tastes like. But you also tell us what the bottle that you can afford at your neighborhood uh, store is and enjoy it. So we thank yeah, you for that. You know, there are, I have to say, there are great wines. Um, by great, that's kind of a loaded term. So by great wine, you could mean one that is simply rare because they don't make very much of it and therefore charge up the wazoo for it. Uh, or you could talk about a wine which is uh, of very, very high quality that doesn't necessarily cost all that much money. But there are reasons why, it's, we, we talked about this before, as a matter of fact, it's, it's supply and demand. If I only make 100 bottles of a wine that 1,000 people want, I could charge $1,000 a bottle. But if I like 50,000 bottles of a really good wine, well, i got to unload that onto 50,000 people who are willing to pay whatever. Fifty, a hundred, two hundred dollars for it doesn't mean it's always, not a bad. Mm. But why? Yeah, John, uh, you're always informative. This is uh, wonderful. I, I'm not a uh, connoisseur of wine, but I do, I do love a good glass, and I love tasting different kinds of wine. So you're, this is very helpful. Well, that's what I was born to do. <laughs> well, you're good at it. We'll Thank see you, you again soon. God said, you're not going to be rich, but it's not going to be a bad life. <laughs> <laughs> Out. Clap, please.
For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.